All right, welcome to episode 88 of the Jake Blanchard podcast. Powerful conversation today. You know, when I set out to do this podcast, I wanted to uh, seek out folks who are out there accomplishing some awesome stuff and that could provide a point of view that maybe I haven't considered or that I knew very little about. Rhea Story is absolutely one of the most amazing people uh, I've had the pleasure of chatting with. We talked about a variety of topics, it also included sexual and emotional abuse, human trafficking, leadership, confidence, women in leadership, and so much more. She's out there making impact. Look her up, give her a follow. We need more people like her uh, in the world, spreading love, positive energy, a growth mindset, and her work helping people find their voices is absolutely inspiring. Uh, a couple sponsors here, Fuel Hunt, they're awesome. Sponsored athlete and undefeated UFC welterweight fighter, Sean Brady. Just one Fury grappling three against Craig Jones, who's arguably one of the best no-gi grapplers in the world. It's a huge win. Uh, and it's cool to be associated with Fuel Hunt and watch all the cool things that Sean Brady's out there doing. So go to fuelhunt.com, check out their apparel, their gear, uh, and their messaging. They're an awesome brand with a lot to say. And use that code JBP at checkout, land yourself 15% off your order. Also Fellowship Brand, they make premium men's grooming products. The code JBP at checkout gets you 10% off of beard oils, tattoo balms, and so much more. They've got signature signature scents. That's hard to say. Signature scents uh, like Mariner, uh, which is my favorite. And there's nothing else like it, in my opinion, in the market. They're high quality. It's all natural. Check them out. Fellowshipbrand.com. And again, JBP is the code that helps save you some moolah. So with that, enjoy the discussion with the undeniably awesome Rhea Story. All right, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Rhea Story. She's an author, speaker, leadership coach with a passion for helping women increase influence and maximize results when she's not speaking, publishing, or helping people realize their potential. She's an active member of the Georgia Statewide Task Force on Human Trafficking. I recently saw her and her husband speak at the Idaho Manufacturing Alliance. She's absolutely outstanding. Honored to have her on the show. Rhea, welcome. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Jake. Hey, you know, uh, I'm going to start talking about the weather here because it is dumping snow in oh, Boise, no. Idaho. We, I looked at a weather advisory. I was supposed to kind of sneak out for the weekend and uh, it's like 12 to 18 inches coming down in the next two days. Oh my goodness. Headed. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you're over on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. you, you deal with much snow where you're at? No, it snows here about once a decade. And whenever it does, it's like the apocalypse is happening. So <laughs> right now it's almost 70 degrees and pouring rain. So oh, there you go. And you're out there in Georgia. Yes. Yeah. Just South of Atlanta. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, you, you from the South originally, and you grew up in the South. Did you ever live anywhere that had a bunch of, uh, of snow? Winter? Never, never lived anywhere that had a lot of snow. I am originally from Alabama. So, you know, just really right here in the, in the Southeast. Um, it's always fascinating to know of people who, who deal with that on a daily basis. And it just seems like it takes so much energy to stay warm and dry and, and deal with the snow, but it's so beautiful. So I'm a little jealous yeah, for a few days <laughs> for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had your, this is kind of fun for me because uh, I had your husband Mac on, um, he was my last guest on the podcast. So when, you know, when you read down the podcast, you know, we got a Mac story and we got a Rhea story. Um, and I think that's phenomenal because you're both very interesting people. I mean, Mac and I spent an hour or so talking about process improvement. We talked about leadership, um, his perspective on just really putting it in simple terms um, for folks, uh, especially that whole blue collar leadership brand uh, that you both mm -hmm. Uh, work under uh, and just helping people understand the value of self-improvement, self-development, uh, yeah. process improvement, all of that. I've got to ask where you've written more, you've written a bunch of books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you've written a lot of books. Like, and, and I did, I was preparing for this and I was like, how, how many is it? Is it 16? Is it 18? Like how many books have you written now? I've got 13 books and then six uh, journals, what I call my motivational planning journals. It's like a daily, you know, a daily morning routine kind of journal uh, planning yeah, guide. Absolutely. So like, tell me, tell me your process in kind of writing. Like, I'm so, I, I just wanted to start with this. Anytime somebody says that they've written a book, I'm impressed. 
<laughs> and then when they're like, yeah, I've written like 13. And then I got these six journals, like, like, take me through your thought process when it comes to distilling down those nuggets of information that people need and then, and, and then expanding on them in, in a book. Sure. Well, you know, the first book I wrote was 64 pages and they were four inch pages. So when I wrote the first book back in 2014, I didn't have a whole lot to say back then. Yeah. So it was interesting because I had a very, you know, very, very little, you know, and I struggled to fill up the 64 pages, but I knew I wanted to write a book, but it's like anything. We don't do anything well the first time, right? So I just knew I had to start somewhere and that's where I started and what I realized was that the more I was intentional about growing and developing myself the easier it was to articulate those thoughts and then write more so writing came much easier after I was more intentional about my own personal and leadership development so these days it really is a, a process of first just one central core message that, that I want to put into the book and then brainstorming on the different key points for that. Um, Mac and I both love short chapters in, our, in all of our books. So we go for maybe 30 points because 30 days in a month, you know, 30 seems like a nat natural number. And then we go for just, you know, maybe 30 key points, but then short chapters, so three page chapters per topic, per point that you want to, to speak about on that chapter. And once you've got that outline, then you just sit down and start writing. And it seems simple um, once I have the structure. I think the structure is very important for me and, and helping me be able to really collect my thoughts and keep that organized. No, absolutely. You know, I was perusing uh, the titles of your book. I was looking at your website and your story. And I watched your TEDx uh, talk, mm -hmm. your seven-minute TEDx, which is um, powerful. And um, I don't know, but would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and, and your story? And then, you know, I think that it contrasts really well uh, against this journey that you've been on to be this high performance leader and this coach and this developer uh, of individuals. And um, yeah, we'd really like to just get anchored in to, to your backstory. Yeah, sure. Um, I was a, a victim of sexual abuse starting at age 12 uh, from my father. And the abuse progressed as I got older and as he got bolder. And by the time I was 17, he was regularly having sex with me and would bargain with me uh, for sexual favors in exchange for something like a night out with my friends. And he always said in, in his words that he wanted to give me the the ultimate experience in life. And that looked like a lot of different things. Um, sometimes it was beating me black and blue with a riding crop. Sometimes it was taking nude photographs of me. And, and sometimes it was sharing me uh, with men he would meet on the internet and would traffic me. And there were times when life was almost not worth living. And I thought about it. I thought about a tub of warm water and a razor blade because in that situation, I didn't have a lot of hope for ever getting out. You know, I could never see that, that life would ever be different. And, you know, the thing about it is my story is unfortunately not that uncommon, but it's not everyone's story. But what's common for all of us in the human experience is we all face adversity in life. And I've realized that we can take what life gives us and be bitter about it or, or better because of it. Because what happens to us influences us, there's no doubt. But it doesn't determine us. Right. And that's the big thing is that history is not destiny. So at 19, I met a, a knight in a shiny Camaro. And 20 years later, we've long since gotten rid of the car, but I, I married him and um, I left home. I left home at 19. I didn't have a car. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a high school diploma. I'd never been to school. I had a duffel bag and a couple of pillowcases of clothes. And um, and that was it. Well, wow. and we'll. we'll... I, that speech one it's so you're like to read it and to see some of the th the the things that you've put out obviously at TEDx but to hear you talk through it right now it's 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 difficult to wrap my head around uh, as a father I have a six-year-old daughter like it's it's um such a foreign concept one that that uh how how did you you're 19 years old and you leave home and Night and shiny Camaro. I love, I, I love that uh, as well. Knowing that uh, who that's about as far as Mac goes. Um, how did you start making heads or tails of the situation? Like, like maybe take me through that process. 
You know, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it back then. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just shove that into a closet somewhere in the deep, dark re recesses or warehouse of the mind and lock the door and throw away the key. You know, I didn't want to talk about what happened to me. I didn't want people to know. Um, I didn't want people to see me as a victim. I wanted to just consider myself, you know, strong and, and um, not even talk about the pain and the just emotional trauma that, from all of the years of abuse. And that's survival, but it's not really healing uh, because until we own our story, it owns us, right? Until we're able to say, yes, there's a, a scar there, but the scars can make us stronger. Until we're able to own that, it's going to control us at some level. Um, but I really, you know, again, I couldn't have articulated that, that back then, but I knew I could spend the rest of my life blaming my lack of success for what happened to me. Or I could just, you know, put it past and put it behind me and say, I'm going on. And the only job I could find was working as a waitress at Pizza Hut. And I okay. speak for a lot of youth groups and high schoolers these days. And I love to ask those kids, I'm like, how much money do you think I was making back before most of them were born, right, at this point? Right. And they're always like, oh, $10 an hour, $15 an hour. I'm like, $2.13 an hour, plus some tips. $2.13 an hour to pick up, you know, half eaten pizza crust off the floor and bust dirty tables. Now there's nothing wrong with that, right? We all start somewhere and that's just where I started, but it didn't take me long to realize number one, that's not what I want to do the rest of my life. No. And number two, the job of my dreams isn't going to come find me at pizza hut. And so I realized if I wanted life to be different, I was going to have to do something different. And again, in that, in that, phase of life it was more about just pushing the past behind me and just saying i'm just gonna ignore it pretend it didn't happen you know you just said something the job of my dreams isn't going to find me <laughs> at pizza hut it's that, true it's so true and i think there's a lot of people that might be waiting they might be mm. sitting and waiting and thinking that one day something will happen at the place that they're at that will you know, or, or maybe mm -hmm. they're not just going out and finding those target rich environments, putting themselves out there or, or grinding or, or making a commitment to something. That's why I tell my coaching clients sometimes too, is like, it's not about having a perfect plan necessarily. It's just about having a plan and going out <laughs> and moving and doing something. And, and you know, if the, the worst thing that happens is you get three to six months down the line and you have to scratch something off that you're not truly interested in. Oh, I want to be an architect. Okay. Well, you know, six months later, you realize you don't want to be an architect. Well, at least, you know, you don't want to be an architect anymore. Mm -hmm. And at least you weren't sitting around waiting. So, so powerful. The job of my dreams isn't going to find me uh, at Pizza Hut. That's, it's, so then you have this perspective shift or this, this understanding or this, this kind of, how did you start acting upon um, your professional growth, your professional development? Uh, well, I started literally by I had, first I had to go study and, and get my GED because I didn't have a high school diploma. Um, and then I started taking some community class college classes at the local community college and um, progressed. You know, I eventually left waiting tables and went to a more of an administrative office type job and progressed in that role and progressed in my career. And it took me all, just over 10 years to get done going to college to get the degree I wanted to get the job I wanted. And I'm a slow learner, but you know, that was, I think that there are three types of limiting beliefs in life. The first one is I can't have what I want, or I can't do or have, or be what I want in life because I'm not good enough, smart enough, tall enough, whatever enough, right? That, that deep fear or belief inside of us that I'm not worthy of what I want, right? That's the first type of limiting belief. The second type is believing that someone else should do it for us. And the third type is someone else will do it for us, right? And any of those types of limiting beliefs will hold us back because as long as we're blaming someone or something else for our circumstances, we won't do anything to improve it. And I realized that, and you know, sure, it took 10 years, but you're going to get, you're going to get older anyway, right? You might as well be fighting for what you want, for what you are striving for. 
And, you know, over the years, by the time, by the time it was 2012, 2013, you know, I had a great career. I had a great job. I had a great organization. I worked for great leaders and I considered myself successful, you know, certainly considering where I'd started from, you know, I never expected to be even there. But there's a difference between success and significance, right? Success is about myself. Significance is about someone else, right? I, from a leadership perspective, it's like climbing to the top of the mountain and being successful in our own right. But significance is about walking down the mountain and helping somebody else climb, right? And I, I wasn't there. But in 2013, I heard uh, Les Brown speak. And Les Brown is a motivational speaker if you haven't heard him you got to Google him, look him up on YouTube, but he's speaking at a conference to this whole room full of people. And he says, you have a story to tell and someone needs to hear your story. And I thought I've got a story. All right, but I don't want to tell it. I worked yeah. really hard to get away from that. But six months after hearing those words, I shared my story publicly for the first time. And 10 days after that, I resigned from that job I'd worked so hard to get because I discovered the difference in between a career and a calling. Mm. So was that, well, there, there had to have been a moment maybe before that Les Brown talk that you heard or, or whatever that you were like, man, I've kind of like made it a little bit. Like I'm, I'm safe. I'm like, I've made it out. Mm -hmm. Like my life is in order to some degree. Like I'm doing the thing, like maybe take me to that moment. Like it's kind of reflected in that period of time. You know, I think really, really, I felt successful. Uh, mostly, I think really that, that level of safety is probably not the right word, but that level of feeling successful as an individual really came when I uh, started working. I was working at the time for a hospital and working in corporate compliance and, uh, you know, again, great organization with great leaders. And I had been very uh, fortunate and, and or blessed, if you like that word, to to be there. And I was given, you know, a lot of opportunities. And I can see a shift in my growth, personal growth and leadership development um, there when I started there in 2008. And again, it was a great organization and they offered so many opportunities for development in and outside of the organization. And I took advantage of every single one I could um, because it, you know, it, it opened so many different avenues. And so I, you know, again, I wouldn't have articulated it back then, but that's when I really started to be more intentional about just not developing myself in the competencies competencies are important, right? And up until that point, you know, going to college, getting a degree, that's competency. We need those things to, to some degree to open doors. It's the skills and abilities. But I think 2008 was really when I started developing my, my character, right? And character is who we are, how we do what we do. And when I started focusing on developing that side of myself, that's really when I saw my success just start to compound personally and professionally. Oh, I love that. And uh, character is a, um, it's such a powerful word, something that I think mm -hmm. about on a regular basis, as far as things like integrity and honesty, uh, loyalty, having the fortitude to do things like there's a lot of words, um, that support that idea of character. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that you work on today as you're coaching individuals? Is that kind of a, like a foundational point for you since it sounds like it was maybe a point that you started in? Absolutely. I think it's, I think it's a foundation for all of us, whether we know it or not. Um, and you know, it's, it's difficult to pin down exactly how you develop your character. Right. But, but I think that there are some proven ways to do it in every dimension of life reading or, you know, if you're maybe not a book person, audiobooks or podcasts or whatever, right? That intentional growth of, of the emotional dimension, our headspace, new ideas, new perspectives, raising that level of awareness um, emotionally, you know, spiritually, relationally, right? Am I growing and developing my character relative to the relationships in my life, personal or professional? How am I working on my communication skills or connecting? Um, and that's, you know, character development and then physical. Um, and I'm a big fan of that because I think that was, that was key in helping me grow my confidence, my sense of self-worth and, and rebuilding an identity, not as a victim, but, but as a survivor. Um, and I think when we grow and develop our character in one dimension of life, it, 
helps us grow in the other dimensions of life kind of by default right you you kind of grow one area the other one is going to start to to pull along um and i think that's that's powerful right whether we're building discipline physically or we're building discipline emotionally right that's a skill set that serves us well in life yeah and so then you you develop some character or your character as you're you're growing and maturing um, you hear this Les Brown discussion, you decide to start sharing your story, you decide to start writing books, you, you get out on the speaking series uh, uh, circuit a little bit as well. When did you and Mac really start like collaborating, collaborating, like working together? And, and what's that dynamic like? like <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm so fascinated by it when you guys are on stage and you work so well together. And I'm like, man, I, I wonder if they like, I don't know. I, I, I pictured myself and my wife up there trying to, and I think we do a pretty good job, but I think we'd get back to like the hotel room and we'd be like, Hey, what was that about? Like, you know, you know what I mean? To, tell me about that dynamic. You know, it's funny because when we started really Mac wanted to focus on leadership training and I wanted to be the speaker. And even in as late as 2015, I was doing keynote speaking without him. And at some point, we kind of realized that whether we call it speaking or whether we call it training, we're both talking about the same principles. Yeah. And so then that was kind of a shift to say, well, we could do it together. Now, there were there certainly have been some learning opportunities in that because Mac is, as you know, he's so passionate about what he has to say. And, you know, I'd be like, hey, I want to talk too, right? I'm on stage. Yeah. I want to talk too. Um, and so we did have to learn to to balance that. And, you know, it's kind of like playing ball with somebody. You got to remember to toss the ball back so someone else has a turn. And we, you know, we figured that out. And the the different audiences dictate that a little bit, right? If you saw us in Idaho, it was a, obviously the the Idaho Manufacturing Alliance. It was a blue collar type event. And, and we were talking about Max blue collar leadership. So he did a lot more of the talking there versus a women's event. I would do a little more of the teaching. So yeah, we kind of had to figure out that that give and take and that ebb and flow. And at the end of the day, we both realized that we both have great stuff to say. And so I think it's important to remember that I don't have to always be the one to make the, the key points, right? He's got great information and he can share that. Maybe I have something I want to say too, but at the end of the day, the audience is getting value and they enjoy the dynamic of the two of us. So we really, we really started to enjoy it at that point, working together and just saying, you know what, we, we got married because we like each other. So let's, let's do life together. And, you know, when you live, work and travel with the same person, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you got to go way beyond loving that person. You got to like them because we spend <laughs> a lot of time together. You got to go way beyond love. You got to like them. I, li I like that because that, that was the thing that I was, uh, you know, I love. And of course I like my wife as well, but, uh, again, I, I ponder the, uh, I ponder what that would be like. Um, and then like, do you have, so when my wife and I sit down, we have, own a couple businesses and, and do a few things together uh, as well, uh, but just not, not traveling and whatnot. The only thing we really have to talk about is like strategy and finance mostly. <laughs> and, and um, like, I have to like, I'm taking off my husband hat and I'm putting on my, my business person hat right now. I'd like you to mm. do the same. And then we put it on and we just try to like divorce ourselves from like emotion about it. And then just like really talk about it in narrow, like businessy terms. And then I'm like, I'm putting back my husband hat on now. <laughs> hey, I love you. Like, do you have to do that? Do you have to like, you know, uh, uh, reset your, your mindset uh, around it? Or does it all just kind of flow together for you now? It all flows together. Uh, no, it, it really, it really does. And I think part of that just comes with time and, and having done it you know, obviously together for quite some time now, uh, we, you know, we always walk away going, what can we, what do we need to improve? What do we, what can we do better? Right. Um, but we don't consciously say, okay, let's shift and have a conversation about this. Um, yeah. and Mac is very spontaneous, you know, very much off the cuff. And so he, he wouldn't do well, well with structure like that anyway. <laughs> I love that. Oh man. So, you know, I'm on, uh, I've got your website, uh, up as well, reastory.com. Um, you do personal and professional development, uh, excuse me, personal and professional leadership development for women. Uh, and in big, bold letters, it says, become the woman you are destined to be, become the leader you are destined to be. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to augur in on this a little bit. Tell me one, 
Uh, why focus on women and women leadership and what really interests you about that space? And then like, how have you grown that business? And I'm interested to hear, you know, your perspective, how you approach it. Yeah. I, I think this is not an, this is not a feminist statement and Mac would agree with me. So right. no, go <laughs> um, ahead. I, I feel like because leadership is relational, right? Leadership is based on the relationship. Relationships are built on trust. If you don't know me, if you don't trust me, you're, I can't influence you very much, right? Leadership is influence. I have to have a relationship to influence you at a high level. I feel like women are by nature, just a little more relationship oriented. Yeah. And I, they just tend to be a little more nurturing. So I think that that can be an incredible advantage when it comes to influence. I think a lot of women have learned to influence people without a position of authority, perhaps because they didn't, you know, they didn't have a position of authority. You know, they've had to learn to work with people and get things done from wherever they were. And I think that's a great skill when it comes to leadership and influence. If you know how to balance that with actually getting results, right? It's great to just love people and, and have great relationships, but in a work environment, a professional environment, we've got to also get results in the organization. And I think a lot of women aren't sure how to navigate that. And so sometimes they overcorrect and go, too much the other way, you know, feel pressured to be more uh, domineering or less relational, maybe harder instead of softer, if you like those words. But that's, you know, that's not authentic to our own leadership style. And, and at the end of the day, we end up rupturing relationships when we shift too much to that side. So why specifically for me to focus on women is I think that that's really where I just feel cold because I, I realized that I at some point early in my career, I didn't feel like I was a leader. I thought leadership is for the CEO or the, the director or the boss. And it's true, those people need leadership skills. But when I realized that leadership is influence, I have some influence, regardless of a position or title. And I want more of it. And I think, I think most women are frustrated not realizing how to grow their influence skills, how to grow their leadership skills. And that's really where I feel called to just, you know, that's what breaks my heart because I was that person who didn't feel like a leader. And so not realizing the potential for influence. Again, it's not about a position or title. It's influencing at home with your kids. It's influencing your coworkers at work. It's influencing the community. And I think that a lot of women don't ever reach their potential in life or in leadership because they, they haven't grasped that foundational truth of, of I can grow my influence. I can develop my leadership skills. And we all want more influence, right? You think of any time in life when you were mad or sad or frustrated with someone, I guarantee you, it's because you wanted to influence them and couldn't. And yeah. I think that's that's human, but I think women particularly have a need there to, to have that shift and that mindset shift and then grow those skills. Yeah, I think the, the, the other thing that I'm picking up on too uh, as well here is intent. Right. And mm. so it's like, you can feel, you can feel powerless or frustrated um, about the situation. And then you might realize that like, Hey, the reason that I feel powerless is I would like to be able to influence this situation. Mm -hmm. And then they're setting the intention of like building the skills necessary in order to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of wonder after you start connecting the dots uh, with folks, like what's that What's maybe that maturation arc? What's that kind of look like for people once they've decided that they want to, they, they, they can pinpoint the lack of influence or mm -hmm. that they want to be a leader, but like, how do you start getting there? I think first it starts with responsibility. Um, and I'll give you an example. There was a time in my career where I was working for a, not a great leader, <laughs> not a great boss. Um, and, and that is my responsibility, right? Not her lack of leadership, not her lack of character, but I absolutely have to take responsibility for getting myself in that situation, right? I interviewed for the position, I accepted the position, and when I'm in the position, I've got to take responsibility, again, not for that person's lack of leadership, but for, hey, what I did to contribute to this situation of working for a poor leader. And I've got to accept responsibility for saying, you know what, if I want to stay frustrated with the lack of leadership or the lack of character 
in that situation, number one, I've got to, if I'm on the team, I've got to be playing on the field, so to speak, right? If I'm going to stay there, I've got to accept responsibility for doing the best job that I can. Even if I feel like I'm not being treated well or, or treated poor, uh, like I should be. But, but if I don't want to stay there, you know, if I don't want to continue to deal with that frustration or if, if I feel like, you know, this isn't a fair situation, then I got to take responsibility again for developing myself, for giving myself options to find a better situation. But I think a lot of times we spin our wheels and we say, you know what, this person is a bad boss or a bad leader or I'm not getting paid what I'm worth. And so we just sit there and, and stew about it and that's not going to fix it. And I think every no. individual has to realize that responsibility. It starts with me. Hal Elrod said, the moment I accept responsibility for anything, I'm sorry, the moment I accept responsibility for everything is the moment I can change anything. You know, we can't control other people. We cannot control what they say. We cannot control what they do. We always have the freedom to choose how we respond. And that's the greatest freedom emotionally is realizing I, you know, I maybe have made some choices that got me here, but I can absolutely make some choices that can take me out of here. And that's, that's freedom, right? Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm also curious. I'm, I'm a one well, admittedly a dumb man. So I'm <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I joke around. It's just, you know, the, the thing is like, I'm very careful when it comes to uh, kind of modern day issues, especially as it pertains to like women in business. I, I, I feel like my heart is like, I respect everyone as equals though. Like I'm, I'm careful because it, there are likely things that I do that that might not live up to that expectation that I'm I'm not aware of those types mm -hmm. of things and what I know that it's created there's a lot of shitty men leaders out there just to say that there's a lot of people who are this kind of patriarchal you know misogynistic like keeping people down uh type thing but what I've seen in some leadership type coaching or seminars or things that I've sat in at conferences for years that are about women in leadership is that there's almost an adversarial type tone to certain things. And I just wanted your perspective. You're in this space. Like, do you feel like there's kind of an adversarial like men versus women? Or is it like, this is how you like, because I've heard man's world, like trying to compete in a man's world. And it's like, no, it's our world. Like, I, I can't wrap my head mm. around some of that. So I need some coaching here, Rhea. Like, help <laughs> me understand from a you know, feminine perspective, from a woman's perspective, who's, who's in this space, like, how should I be thinking about some of this stuff? Uh, you know, I, I think, number one, I think we all have some of those inherent or learned uh, subconscious or unconscious, you know, habits or, or biases or, or whatever, right? But, yeah. but we, again, we've taken responsibility for saying, I, I'm going to work on that, my blind spot, so to speak. But I think, uh, to your point, I think that anyone who wants to embrace the adversarial um, attitude is almost creating an enemy, right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I look at that, if I look at any industry and say, I cannot be successful there because I'm a female, right? I'm blaming my lack of success on genetics. And there again, I'm blaming someone or something else for my circumstances. And so I'm giving away my power and freedom to, to change it, to improve it. So I think that's, you know, that's number one, a, a self-defeating prophecy is saying, I can't be successful because of. Now, there, there absolutely are going to be situations and scenarios where someone does have a bias. Perhaps it's based on just gender. Uh, you know, there could be a bias of, of anything, right? Religion or a race or anything like that. And, and there are going to, you know, by nature, you're going to encounter some people who you may not be able to grow your influence with them or, or be successful with them. But but there again, I can find a different situation. I can find a better situation. There are phenomenal leaders of all, you know, of both genders. And, and I, I don't want to ever see it, someone just take the mindset of it's a fight man versus woman, because it's really right. not right? right. They're incredible leaders of all walks and, and all backgrounds. And, you know, there again, women may have a natural tendency to be more relationship oriented, but not all women are great leaders, you know, absolutely. And, and not all men are poor leaders. And so I just, I like to be very careful about generalizations because I think they, they can limit us. 
I agree 100%. And I appreciate that perspective as well. I, I, I get scared with the generalizations. I feel like I feel like it's an exercise in intellectual laziness. I feel like we do mm. it quite often as a society uh, today uh, because we don't have a lot of time to put deep thought into things. And so like putting it in a bucket or a container that makes sense for us, like this is happening because mm -hmm. these guys suck or like I'm a victim here or, you know, I can never do this because ge my genetics say I can't, you know, well, you know whatever it is, um, it, it's a scary pattern of thought, but one that, you know, everybody kind of falls into at least in one or two areas of their life of, of their blind spots, uh, to your point earlier. Mm. Um, you mentioned, or I mentioned actually, uh, in, in the introduction that, uh, you're a member of the Georgia statewide task force on human trafficking. And, mm -hmm. you know, with the conversation that we've had thus far, obviously the growth and professional development and leadership and, and obviously the trauma early in life, like, what are you doing with these folks? How do you work with this group? Uh, I volunteer, I serve as a volunteer as a, a, uh, we have a, we have nine different subgroups for the task force or the statewide task force. And each subgroup has a different focus. One might focus on raising awareness of what trafficking looks like. One focuses on prevention. One focuses on adults. Um, I work with the subgroup that focuses on helping survivors recover and, and thrive. And that's really, you know, my heart because, I think that's where I can give the most, right, is saying, you know what, it's terrible, it's horrible, and it's heartbreaking, but it doesn't have to define the rest of your life, and I'm living proof of that, and I, you know, if, if I could do anything, it would be that example. I don't share my story now, so anybody will feel sorry for me. I share it so that they can look at me and say, if she can overcome what she went through, I can overcome what I'm going through in my life. And so I serve um, in that subgroup and we do events, um, development events for survivors across the state, um, you, you know, helping them learn life skills, helping them learn mindset skills, helping them learn coping skills. Um, and so one of the cool things is we've been doing is using my book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Me, as a curriculum. And so we basically have a book study where we have a group of, of teenagers and we sit down and we share um, some time together. Everyone takes turns reading a paragraph and then the next person reads a paragraph and we, you know, we cover a chapter and then we share, you know, what, what that resonated, what, what did I get out of that? How did that speak to me or, or what's an issue I could work on like that? And it's incredible to see the growth of these young women because it's the it's the process right it's the process of growth it's not it's it's not that the principles are earth shattering i mean principles are timeless they've been around from the beginning of time right but i think what i can do is help wrap those principles in something that's easy to understand and then people can see how they can apply it to their own life and so when we regularly involve ourselves in a process of growth we grow and that's the cool thing is to just see, you know, the mindset shift of someone who's been through something and been traumatized so much and to have them realize that they have a sense of self-worth and they can develop their own sense of identity. Again, not as a victim, but as someone who's victorious over trauma. Now, when there is a task force that has nine subgroups in it um, and you are with groups of women it makes me, I, I kind of feel like this is a, like a large issue. Like, a, like how big is it in, just in Georgia? I mean, do you have any numbers or stats around human trafficking in Georgia or what the size and scope that we're talking about? Yeah, it's a multi-billion dollar industry um, annually. And the numbers are, are staggering, right? I mean, just billions of dollars. Uh, made off of people. And it's not, the task force is not limited to just sex trafficking. It also focuses on labor trafficking, um, which is, I didn't realize was such a, an issue as much as uh, perhaps maybe not quite as much as sex trafficking, but, but labor trafficking is when someone is, you know, forced to work under circumstances, they don't want to be there, but maybe someone is, is here and they're promised a job. And so they, they immigrate to the country, but then they, you know, the person takes their passport or their papers or their green papers or something. So they cannot, you know, they don't have any other options. And so they're forced to work under bad circumstances or for little money or poor wages. Um, and there's so, so there's a whole subset to that. And so when you start to realize the 
this, I mean, billions of people, um, you know, worldwide over history have been trafficked. It's an enormous problem. I think that the, the main problem is that nobody's talking about it, right? We don't even talk about the fact that we don't really talk about it. Yeah. Until some famous, you know, famous case pops up and it raises awareness, but most people don't realize what trafficking looks like. But I mean, when we're talking about famous cases, uh, I, I tell you what, the, the, the most famous probably ever just, uh, it was happening when one half of it, uh, was suicided. And then the other half, um, mm. was only charged with six counts and obviously, um, you know, this is, we're recording this on the 30th. So I believe the 29th or the 28th, the verdict came through as five or six counts on Justine Maxwell. Um, but they, I mean, I, there's a lot of criticisms that the prosecution didn't throw the book at, at mm. this person at all. There's a lot of counts that didn't even make it. There's a lot of, uh, high profile public figures that likely should be held accountable, um, for their affiliation association or acts, uh, that happened. Like, so I'd love your perspective uh, on have you, did you follow the case at all? Like, was this something that you were watching? Is this something that you were just kind of ancillary to? Um, I did not follow it closely um, for, you know, I, because it's very easy to get caught up in the emotions of, of things like that. And so, you know, and it's not specific to this case. I, I don't watch a lot of news. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't read a lot of, I like, because that is for me, if you go back to S Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people, those are things that are circle of concern, right? They're there. We are concerned about them, but it's nothing I can directly affect or influence. So I need the cliff notes. I don't like to get mired down in the day to day, um, you know, following every moment of the trial, so to speak. Um, but my perspective, I, number one, I think it's, it's incredibly validating for those survivors to see some you know, some sense of justice, right? Some public a recognition and acknowledgement of a wrong done to them. And I imagine that most of them felt robbed of that um, with Epstein. And, and so I think that there was some validation there. Um, I can only imagine that, that that relief of just feeling, again, validated, because one of the main problems that we have this issue is deeply rooted because survivors, number one, feel like someone's not going to believe them. And so they don't come forward with it. And then when they, if they do make the decision to come forward with it, then there's a very um, public, uh, a very public digging into that survivor and, and are they being truthful and did they make this story up? And there again, almost a, you know, our legal system is set up, you know, from our founding fathers to say, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? And our, our legal system is intentionally set up about that. And all of us would want that, that right of being innocent until proven guilty, right? But when it's a, particularly when it's a sexual trauma, and there's so much inherent shame with that, mm -hmm. there is a very, um, very deeply rooted sense of, I don't want to come forward and talk about this and go to the, you know, and, and then have all of this revisited and brought up in such a public way. And then to get through all of that and then have someone say, well, you might be making this up. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't have a quick fix of how to change that, but there's, there's not a lot of support for a survivor coming forward with um, issues like this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and I think you bring up a good point. Like it's, it, it's also like, what, what is the right way to be able to come forward? You mm -hmm. know, like, and, and maybe that will take time to, to figure out, I don't know, do you have a, do you have a perspective of what that, what that process would look like from a, like a legal slash social, it's such a messy process. Like you just, you just brought up mm -hmm. because it's, it's an individual who's been a victim of some kind of the heinous thing that has to come out in the public, be judged, and then for you the rest of your life. I mean, there's there's things that, mm -hmm. that come along with that. People find things out about you or whatever it is long term. Like, but it must be a, a life altering process. And, and, and as fragile as a topic it is, uh, how ham fisted <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the institutions around it uh, may be. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, there again, I don't necessarily have a, a quick fix or this would fix everything, but I think what, um, what's important is, you know, people who are 
willing to speak out publicly because I think that it's important for other people to know there again, you know, be the example. Um, and that's one reason I share my story is because I want people to know, you know, this is an issue and it happens. It doesn't look like you think um, it might happen. A lot of people have a perspective of what trafficking is and and don't really know. It could be your family. It could be the guy next door. You know, it, it could be a female, right? So we have kind of a, um, a general idea, but it could be false. So I think that that's, that's step number one is we have to be vocal about it. We have to hold those who are accountable, accountable, you know, and that sometimes that is being more vocal about it and sharing the hard stuff and it's not fun and it's not easy, right? This would be an issue we would love to not talk about, but not talking about it doesn't fix it. I think it's Edward, Edmund Burke who said, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. Um, so I think we all have a, a part to play. Absolutely. So you're, uh, you're back traveling, you're, you're traveling around speaking all that. What do you, what do you have coming up? What are you excited about uh, in, in the next couple months as far as like events or things that, uh, that you're up to? Uh, we are traveling a good bit more. There was a, um, a season during COVID that we didn't, we didn't travel much of anywhere, but um, January kicks off. I think we're going to North Carolina. I think we are going back to Texas uh, we've got, uh, as, as it's turning out, quite a busy spring. And in the middle of all that, I actually qualified to run the Boston Marathon. So I'm training and traveling. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm traveling and training and trying to get all of that worked in. But, uh, you know, it's a great, it's a great, you know, just rewarding sense of satisfaction to have achieved that goal and that milestone. So looking forward to that um, coming up in April. Wow, that's phenomenal. And then uh, the quick shout outs to, uh, to where people can find you, connect with you, like what's your preferred method or where can people go to find out more information about uh, you uh, and your ecosystem? <laughs> you can, uh, the website's the best way to get in touch with me, riastory.com. Um, and, you know, that has contact numbers and all of that. You can also just connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on social, Facebook, Instagram, uh, ria.story. So connect with me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty out there. So. Absolutely. Well, hey, Juan, thank you so much for carving out some time today uh, and exploring that. I think um, it sounds like you've got a lot going on. It's wow. the, as far as the, the books and the leadership training and the development and all the heart um, that you're putting out there um, for others. I'm, I'm just so impressed and honored to have had you on the podcast today. And I'm looking forward to next time you come in Boise. I hope you and Mac reach out. Uh, I'd love to be able to go to dinner, introduce you to my wife, those types of things. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, until next time. Absolutely, Jake. My pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.